Well, let's start the day and take a look at digital finance in Africa. We will hear from three of the top banks in Africa on how they need uh, the, on how they have the need for interoperability among players in the financial ecosystem to become more important today. Now, moderating the panel will be Sigun Aina, president of Africa FinTech Network, and he will be joined by Ebenezer Onyagu, group managing director and chairman of Zenith Bank, Ikbun Awasika, the group chief executive officer at First Bank of Nigeria, and Equity Bank's chief executive officer, James Mwangi. To pose questions to the panel, click on the yellow button beneath the session window. Let's now go over to Segun and his panel of bankers from Africa. Yes, uh, good day, everyone. I now welcome you to this very important and special session, which will be addressing digital finance in uh, Africa. Um, um, when uh, 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 digital finance in Africa, as you know, has made significant impact in the last uh, decade uh, in terms of so many things, particularly ensuring reduction in the financially excluded population in Africa by providing locally required uh, 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 convenient and affordable access to basic financial uh, services in, in Africa, particularly in the area of uh, payment, lending, investment, you know, and so on and so forth. But in spite of that, we still find out that um, access to basic financial services is still a challenge in Africa. But over the years, as I've said, a lot of institution banks, in particular, and the banks that are here are key players in that respect. Uh, other regulated institutions and fintech companies uh, have collaborated, have worked together to ensure a deepening of uh, digital finance operations in Africa, partnership that recognizes the strengths and capabilities of each player and so on and so forth, and addressing some of the challenges, uh, regulatory clarity, appropriate funding mechanism, talent issues, and so on and so on and so forth. Um, there's also the need for interoperability among players and so on and so forth. So this panel today uh, will create opportunity for experience sharing on this subject by two of the top banks in Africa. It's supposed to be three banks. Unfortunately, uh, the chairman of First Bank, uh, Mrs. Bukunwa Wushika, has not been able to join due to some technical challenges. But nevertheless, we have two of the topmost African bankers here on this, uh, on, the, on this panel, whose banks have done incredibly well, wonderful things in digital finance in Africa to share their thoughts as to uh, what has been happening and their perspectives of the future and how this help in you know, uh, uh, developing the various economies and creating uh, wealth for, this, for, the, for the society. So as I've been introduced, uh, Dr. James Wangi is the group, founder and group, uh, and group CEO of uh, Equity, group, Equity Bank Group based in uh, Kenya. Of course, they operate in many countries in Africa. And of, of course, also Mr. Ebeneza Oyegu, who is the group managing director of Zeni Bank, one of the biggest um, you know, most probably banks in, in, in Africa uh, that have been doing wonder, wonderfully well, you know, in, the, in this area. As a banker myself, uh, you know, I, 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 I can attest to the role that these institutions have been playing in the area of digital finance in, 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 in Africa. And we are here to listen, to learn, and uh, to share thoughts and experience in those areas. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining this as, as panelists, and we're looking forward to getting the best insight from, from you as we move on in this uh, se session. Um, to kick it off, I really want you to share your thoughts on this subject matter, your general thoughts on this subject matter, what you have seen happen today, and what is the status of digital finance in Africa. Uh, and I want you to do this maybe two minutes each, maybe starting with uh, Dr. James Wangu, just general thoughts on this, on this subject matter before we go into specific uh, issues. Uh, thank you. I think digitization uh, is here with us. Uh, we are seeing increasingly financial services are being delivered on digital platforms. Uh, that is also being complemented uh, by 
mobile uh, money, uh, which again is uh, delivered uh, digitally. So a combination of that has really demystified uh, digital finance uh, on the continent, whether on the wallet or on bank account. Equity Bank uh, uh, at the moment uh, has 98% of all its transactions happening outside uh, the branch network. So for equity, banking has ceased to, to be the place you go to what you do on devices. When you come to loans, 93% uh, of all loans are originated and completed on the digital platform. So we can uh, essentially say uh, finance uh, in Africa is increasingly becoming digital. And we are seeing greater interoperability and uh, convergence uh, between telecoms and uh, financial service providers across uh, the continent. But of course, there is still uh, room uh, for improvement, given that uh, banks uh, has about, uh, maybe banking has reached only 25% of uh, all adults in the continent. Thank you very much, uh, James, for those insights. You talked a lot about interoperability of the, the, the issues about the various operators, the convergence of technology and products. And of course, uh, uh, we are still in it. There's a room for further improvement in what is happening in Africa. I'm sure Ebenezer uh, Yago will also want to share with us his uh, thoughts in terms of opening the banks on this very sub important subject matter. Yes, thank you very much, Shagun. <coughs> um, it's a pleasure to be on this platform. I think I will define digital finance as the disruptive as well as the creative infiltration of uh, technology in the finance space. Disruptive in the sense that it is challenging existing business model in the finance space and is also throwing up huge challenges for the existing players in the uh, financial sector. It is creative to the extent that it is driving innovation, product innovation, is helping us to, read, to discover the customer journey and enrich it further. It's also accelerating the pace of uh, adoption of the financial inclusion. And for digital finance too, to, take, uh, to really succeed, it has to rest on the anchor of the telephone and the internet. In Zenith Bank, what we've done, we've already converted, we've created platform, omni-platform, that will enable our customers to embark and to be onboarded into our system without having to come to the physical bank. So we do this through the web, we do this through uh, the mobile banking, we do it through the internet, we also do it through um, the use of the feature phone. So even if you don't have um, a smartphone, Whatever kind of phone you have, you are just a step away from opening an account with uh, Zenit. Again, the thing about digital finance is that it has also thrown up a huge challenge for the industry. It has created the problem of cyber uh, security. It's created the problem of cyber crime, which everyone, every player needs to put hands together to checkmate. Indeed, I would like to summarize it by saying that digital finance has turned technology company into uh, financial institutions. And conversely, it has also turned financial institutions like banks to be seen as uh, a digital company with a banking license. So the way it is, digital finance is here to stay. And indeed, the World Bank envisages that the digital economy is expected to grow to as much as $23 trillion, tri trillion by 2025. And this digital economy can only be realized through the strong anchor of digital finance. So it's something that is here to stay. And it's, on, it's, it's also an idea that requires the collaboration of all players to achieve a very effective and meaningful uh, process. Thank you very much, uh, Melissa. Digital finance is here to stay, not only in the world, but also in Africa. You told us about the disruptive tendencies, the trade the creativity that is coming into it, of course, the challenges of cyber security and other things that are, that are, that are, that are coming up. And, you know, you also mentioned this issue of um, banks now seeing themselves as either technology company or software company or a platform 
you know, uh, to offer financial services. So things are really uh, changing, and banks are not looking themselves again in the traditional way that we see banks, and a lot of things are happening. A lot of banks are, you know, even creating the technology companies within their institution or turning the institution into uh, 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 technology companies. These are very, very deep and nice insights. And I want to ask uh, James, you know, um, we, we, we've seen the role that the finance has played in Africa, particularly during this period of COVID-19 with health challenges, where we have now seen a greater level of adoption of digital in transacting services all over the world, but particularly in Africa. People that were not really comfortable with using digital were forced by circumstances to now use digital, using their mobile phone, mm -hmm. uh, using their uh, devices to access financial uh, services. And banks have also created a lot of uh, products that make it easier. So what is your perspective on the sustainability of the gains that we have seen within digital finance uh, during this COVID-19 during this COVID-19 pandemic period? And how can digital finance be leveraged uh, in the economic recovery phase? Because we we hopefully we are getting out of COVID-19 now in the new year, by the beginning of the year, we believe that that will be a thing of the past. How do we sustain this gain? How do we le leverage it in the economic recovery phase? to help support the economic recovery on African countries? Uh, COVID-19 has acted as a tailwind uh, to adoption of uh, digital finance. We have seen uh, uh, financial service providers lacing to create capability and enable their clients uh, to be on digital platforms. We have also seen clients and consumers of financial services embracing uh, digital platforms and digital capabilities and devices, uh, whether internet or mobile enabled, uh, so as to cope uh, with uh, health protocols uh, like reduction of mobility, uh, social distancing, preferring to work from home. That lead, the tool of digital access has really been an enabler of uh, compliance with uh, the health protocols to, uh, to comply with um, COVID-19 regulations. Uh, going forward, I believe that uh, uh, digitization will be sustained and may be scaled much more because of the benefits that it has brought. Uh, digitization has brought convenience, uh, unprecedented con convenience to the consumers. Banking has ceased now to be where you go to what you do on devices meaning uh, financial services have uh, now been enabled uh, and geography and time has been compressed and they are no longer a factor or a consideration for consumption of financial uh, services. The second aspect is that uh, digitization has enabled financial service providers uh, to uh, retool and repurpose uh, the banking models. We are seeing uh, that uh, digitization has introduce self-service platforms, uh, third party use of infrastructure, and consequently the models have come from being brick and mortar led, fixed cost led models, uh, to variable uh, cost models. And essentially that has enabled um, um, most of the service providers to significantly reduce the uh, fixed cost outlay and uh, improving um, cost income ratio significantly. That transformation because of its benefit has been embraced uh, significantly by the service providers uh, because it's productive and rewarding to the service providers. So essentially we are uh, uh, seeing a situation where uh, digital finance has both benefits to the consumers and to the providers of services. I believe uh, digital finance uh, is ushering us uh, as a tool uh, for the fourth industrial revolution. It will enable particularly going forward uh, the use and a, a capturing of big data. Analytics uh, will be, and artificial intelligence will become really enabled tools. Machine learning around all the processes uh, will become a big capability. And so finance has been leapfrogged uh, to become a prime driver of uh, the fourth industrial revolution. 
and maybe this will help Africa to leapfrog on technology, uh, drop the legacy systems, and don't continue to invest in legacy systems. So I can only see not as being sustained, but being accelerated and becoming a tool of transformation of the continent. In the process, as you have suggested, uh, then uh, digital finance will be a big prank on the recovery uh, uh, load map uh, for the African continent. Um, the ease and convenience and uh, lower cost uh, and affordability will certainly help us to make uh, financial inclusion uh, achieve, uh, be achieved much faster than we have ever uh, uh, seen before. The fact that uh, the millage in the African continent is allowed 18 years means the uh, bulk of the population uh, is a digital population and they are, uh, they are comfortable with new technology. So adoption is likely to be enhanced much more. And lastly, is the ability to interconnect financial systems, is the ability to be interoperable. And maybe access to finance will be the driver of digitization of retail commerce and retail trade. And in the process, uh, make the economies much more efficient and hopefully fast track not just to recovery, but the thriving of the African continent. That is the perspective that I see uh, coming on board as we go forward. That is terrific, uh, James, um, in terms of those uh, insights, um, seeing that this is going to be sustainable and even accelerated. As we have seen, some people have posited that uh, digital transformation has been moved six years ahead within just six months. What companies, organizations want to do in six years have been done within six months because of the need you know, to ensure that they're able to serve their customers. So I'm really very, very happy to hear that. And that was also in terms of leapfrogging, how Africa can leapfrog to avoid the legacy system and then joining and participating in the fourth uh, industrial uh, revolution that we are seeing uh, 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 evolving. And I believe that Africa will be the better uh, uh, for, for it. Hmm. Banking is not a bank is not where you go, it's what you do. Just like work today. Work working, you know, you have to do to say I'm going to work. Work is no longer where you, where you go, it's, it is what you do, so you can do your work anywhere. So that is the uh one of the benefits of the of digital. Uh, Ebenezer, um there is yes. this discussion in terms of uh, the role that regulation play, particularly in a continent like uh, Africa, where it appears a number of the regulatory institutions are uh, still struggling to catch up with the speed of technological innovation. Banks are regulated entities. Uh, even fintechs now, a lot of regulators now want to regulate the ability of fintechs, but let those that pay the financial uh, services. James is talking about sustainability and acceleration and so on and so forth. How do we ensure that regulation does not become an arbitrage or constraint, particularly in Africa, towards ensuring this sustainability, this acceleration, this enhancement and growth in, in, digital, uh, in digital finance? So in other words, what would be your thoughts and expectations on how regulators can support the continued evolution and acceleration of digital finance in Africa? Thank you very much. That's a very good question. I think the first thing to say is that um, banking and finance, by its very nature, because of its fiduciary role, must be regulated. And again, if you look at the concept of regulation, you see that typically you always see the regulators behind the market. The market moves before the regulation follows. That's uh, two. The third point is to say that since finance our banking is regulated. And like I said in my opening remarks that technology companies have become financial uh, institutions. Therefore, they should be regulated. They should be regulated. And again, to provide better co uh, context in understanding the role of regulators in the new dispensation of digital finance, let's take a look at one. Under the legacy system, what you see there is that the financial institutions are the repository of customers' information and data. But in a digital finance environment, what do you see? 
customer data is now being stored at different interfaces. These interfaces involve the switching company, the payment facilitators, the aggregators. Then you also have, to some extent, some of the customer's information are being stored in customer's own devices. For instance, SIM cards of customers have become not just SIM card for communication, they've become digital storage spaces. So if we have that, it therefore means that every party involved in the value chain of digital finance has, uh, has to be regulated. Two, you also have the fact that in the conventional or incumbent financial model, what you see there is that customer instruction to process transactions, they are forwarded in a documented source. Um, you have a documented um, source material, which is processed and stored. But in a digital environment, you now see a situation where information and records are being processed in a, a digital manner without you having a documented source document. So what does that mean for me? It means therefore regulators for them to be effective. They need to acquire a higher level of supervisory technology that will enable them to digitize the monitoring and supervisory function that they need to do. The third context again for me is that if you look at the existing model, you find out that if you want to initiate a transaction, you send a request to a bank, the bank will process it. But in a digital environment, it's a do-it-yourself situation. You log on to your bank account from the convenience of your home. It could be from your phone. It could be from your computer. You go ahead and carry out your transaction. Therefore, you are now responsible for the issue around confidentiality because one of the things that one of the key things that drive banking is confidentiality. The fact that you are able to keep customers' information confidential and secure. But in a situation where we are, you discover that customers now in the digital environment, with customers now having access to their information, it behoves on the customer to be able to secure that information in such a manner that is not exposed to third parties. So when you have that situation, what do you expect? A regulator will not come and regulate you in terms of how you log on to your device. You, you now have to self-regulate. You now need to be mindful that when you are in a digital environment, you have to be mindful the kind of email, um, the site you visit, the kind of emails you are responding to. Because if care is not taken, when you expose your, yourself to some of these very fraudulent sites, you stand the risk of details of your banking transaction and closing your devices being harvested by fraudsters. Therefore, individuals and institutions who are going to be playing in a digital environment to help the regulators, we, ne we now must regulate ourselves. Again, regulators can only regulate what they know. If they have no idea of anything, they can't regulate. They are not wizards. We don't expect them to just put their hands at their nose and say, yes, this is what I need to regulate. Therefore, all operators, everyone involved in the value chain will need to collaborate and share information, educate and enlighten the regulators with respect to development that we see. So that in that manner, regulators can now think of a regulatory framework to cover some of this development because in a digital environment, it's an evolving environment. It's evolving, things are happening every day. Then again, you see that the capability of the digital environment rests on the telephone and on the internet. Let's look at the manner in which the telephone subscription is being given, the manner in which individuals register their email addresses. We don't have controls and it is dangerous for the system. It's dangerous for the global financial system for us not to have an effective control over SIM card allocation and subscription over how individuals register their email addresses for it to be effective and regulators to be able to do a proper work of regulation i will be advocating a process where when you are taking you are getting your phone like we have in nigeria we have the bank uh, bank verification uh, number which we call bvn every account you have in nigeria you have a biometric that is identifiable to you since we had that we had dealt with the issue of identity theft there is no identity theft in Nigeria. The same way, but what is lacking is that that same biometrics 
we should be able to use it to drive a, 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 um, registration for SIM card, such that when you have a number, we know we can trace you to that number. That number should be linked to your account. Again, when you have your email, because you have fraudulent emails happening or coming phishing email, defrauding people, because what you see, the limitation to the growth of digital finance is actually cyber risk. And if you look at the magnitude of cyber risk, it has assumed the biggest proportion in terms of the rich person banking industry. It's even expected that it will continue to grow. So we need to have such controls over how the phone is being allocated, how emails are being given, and also the registration of domain addresses. What we have done for ourselves internally is that we do a lot of self-regulation. For instance, in our system, if an email comes, we are able to tell emails coming from our own domain. We are able to tell email coming from external domain. So for you as a staff of Zenith, when you get an email coming from external domain, you just know that your antenna must be up. Because if you compromise yourself, if you expose your, your pin in, an email, I mean, in such a manner, regulators can't do anything. So that's where that self-regulation and discipline come to play. The other thing we equally do to drive the awareness and consciousness of that self-regulation, we send out bait emails. We send out bait emails to try our people in terms of those who could fall victim to phishing mails. And the interesting thing we do, when you fall victim to the phishing mail, we don't penalize you. We bring you, we take you through a period of some process of awareness in terms of the danger and the caution required to operate in a digital environment. And we turn you into a digital cyber champion so that you become an advocate. So what that's helping us to do is that we are getting stronger from our weakest link. So today is almost, I would say it's almost near impossible for any staff to respond to a phishing mail. Because you know that once you respond to a phishing mail, you are going to have additional work apart from doing your work, now doing the work of a, a digital cyber crime advocacy. So we do that. Then the other thing we do is that we collaborate with the market to share information you know, in Nigeria, we were noticing a trend that was very ugly. When a new customer is onboarded, within two to three days, you start getting fraudulent calls from um, fraudsters. We don't know where the calls are coming from, but what we did, that was like a month ago, we reported when we got the numbers, we reported to the security agencies, we encouraged them to trace and track this fraudster, and they tracked them. When the fraudsters were tracked, they confessed that an old and decommissioned app of a bank that once they get it, once they get your, your bank verification number or phone number, once they enter your details into this already decommissioned app, they can get your banking details. But the funny thing is that this bank, this app is no longer in their server. This app is not on Apple Store. It's not on Google Play uh, Store. So which means, again, for regulation to be effective, we now need to regulate how new apps are being onboarded and integrated into the banking system. And also how these apps are being decommissioned. So that when you decommission, you have a situation where completely the information can, you, your, that particular app is, cannot be resurrected in any form. Again, we work with this, the central switch in Nigeria, we call the NIVS, Nigeria Interbank Settlement System. They handle like almost 80% of the uh, digital clearance transaction in Nigeria. We've realized that when for tele, uh, telcos, the mobile money, um, uh, that's mobile telecom operators, what they do when you have a phone number that is inactive for six months, they reallocate it to new, uh, new subscribers. But when they reallocate, they don't bother to check and uh, purge that particular SIM of the digital content in them. So the new subscriber now start having access so the content of what was in that SIM belonging to someone else. Mark you, the phone numbers we carry are no longer ordinary phone numbers. They are containing digital records, banking records. Therefore, that regulation has to involve us looking at how the telecom companies are locating phone numbers. And when a phone number is being allocated, there should be an attempt to completely purge it of the digital content so that the new party you give it to will not have access to someone else's uh, banking details. So these are some of the things we need to do that we need to collaborate as one and help the regulators. We need to educate them. When we find new discovery, we share it. And we're also pushing within the Bankers Committee in Nigeria 
to see how we have an in industry uh, cybersecurity system, such that once you have a problem, we don't need to wait for someone to fall victim. We can share it and use it to develop an effective framework to help the regulator. So is, um, the digital business will certainly grow. For me, what the digital business or digital finance is doing to mankind is like what civilization did to mankind in the times of the Old Stone Age. So it behoves on every one of us to control, regulate, and keep the system safe so that we can continuously onboard customers and improve their confidence in the process. Thank you, Baby. These are, <clears throat> these are very awesome insights in terms of uh, how we can sustain the gains for economic prosperity of Africa. I'm talking about these regulatory issues. I'm very happy you went a lot into it because a lot of people where you meet them, why are you not using digital for your financial transactions? So you know, they don't want to be victim of uh, you know cyber fraud and so on and so forth. So hence you are looking the need for self-regulation and more importantly cyber awareness. We want to be cyber aware so that you don't make yourself vulnerable because these are things that can ensure the sustenance and deepening of, uh, of digital finance in Africa, which compared to other parts of the world is really, really very low. But the, 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 the assurance is that Africa being a generally young, population, young continent with about median age being about 19, about 19 and a half years or so, the, the, and these are the digital natives. We expect that. More and more of them, you know, will uh, you know uh, 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 use more of digital services, and that will ensure that the gains of digital finance in Africa is is, is achieved. And before we go on to some of the other issues, we want to touch. I'm wondering if there are questions. We agreed that we do live uh, questions. I'm wondering whether uh, any question from uh, anyone that we want to take on uh, before we move on to the next segment of this uh, session. Why we are waiting for for that, uh, we need to also be looking, uh, yeah, we're looking at sustenance, we're looking at the future, but specifically, you know, um, we, we have seen the role that this is playing, this time is playing, and it's bound to play a lot more. I want um, my two distinguished the bankers to give their thoughts and perception of important digital financial, financial innovations required in the future of Africa. Uh, there is this uh, African Union uh, 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 objective of the Africa we want, the Agenda 2063, which will be driven largely by digital. What are those things that you think we, we need in Africa? What are those important digital financial, innovation, financial innovations that will help towards ensuring that Africa gets to where you know it should, it should get to? And how do you think this will be accomplished? So that we can leapfrog, we can you know be a part with other developed parts of the world. Um, but maybe James, you want to start that? Yeah, thank you. I think uh, the dream and aspiration of uh, the African Union and generally the African continent is in the right direction, but it really requires to be uh, uh, enabled. And uh, digital finance could be a major driver, uh, not just uh, of facilitating tr uh, trade across the African continent, uh, the African continent, uh, uh, continent free trade area, but uh, an, as, an enabler of integration of yeah. the African continent, such that it's not just um, a free trade area, but it's a free trade area that is heavily in uh, integrated. But for that to happen, we need uh, policy reforms. Policies must be enabling uh, digital finance. We must go back to our uh, policy systems and really ask how do we enable this and uh, formulate policies that are enabling. We must also look at our regulations uh, that uh, facilitate uh, our finance and then and then enable our digital finance uh, uh, broadly, uh, not just uh, within countries but within the continent. We must really deal with the big elephant uh, in the room about uh, nationalism. If we, uh, digital uh, finance, will, we, it's more of a virtual. Uh, it's online business. 
uh, we must really know how to deal with the nation of boundaries. Because essentially, we are now creating platforms uh, as financial service providers, and uh, customers are onboarding themselves. We want mobility of people, goods, capital, and services across the African continent. Finance must also enable in such a manner. We're talking about interoperability. It should be interoperability, one, uh, at the African continent level, at uh, the global level. And that enablement, again, uh, require particularly regulators uh, to really think how that will affect regulation and how regulation at the moment is an enabler or a disabler of that um, aspiration. I think we have touched a lot about uh, the need uh, to carry everybody on board, uh, to carry uh, uh, to carry uh, an inclusive agenda, and consequently there is need uh, for capacity building uh, to the uh, African continent citizens to be able uh, to use the capability of digital finance. We shouldn't assume that everybody will be able to onboard themselves, navigate uh, on platforms, and uh, be able to uh, consume financial services uh, on platforms. Uh, civic education, financial education, financial literacy on digital capability will be essential and necessary so that nobody is left behind. Uh, phobia against uh, technology and digitization, people must be helped to overcome um, that phobia so that we all move together. The issue of uh, protecting people, uh, and uh, my colleague has talked uh, very eloquently about uh, cyber risks. We're talking about uh, uh, leasing your PIN or uh, validation credentials. It's like losing, uh, opening the door to the vault. So we must ensure that people understand uh, the risk involved, how to mitigate the risk, and how to protect themselves. But we must also have legal framework that protect people and recognize these uh, risks and find ways of uh, mitigating them and dealing with them when they happen. So that is a huge opportunity. In terms of regulation, regulation must enable uh, online uh, and digital things like signatures. Uh, digital records, all these must be enabled by regulation for us to have um, the desired impact and for it to be uh, ho uh, embraced uh, uh, wholesale. And maybe we may need to consider whether the issue of um, online virtual businesses should be introduced in the curriculum in our education system. Maybe it's not asking too much uh, to accept that if Africa is to play its rightful role uh, on the for the uh, industrial revolution, then everybody must have the competence and capability uh, to not only operate but to benefit uh, from the fourth industrial uh, revolution and to be able to uh, thrive in the new environment. Uh, of the fourth uh, industrial revolution. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, James. I mean, uh, this is uh, really, really, really very, very good. And I, <clears throat> I like your focus on um, digital financial uh, literacy, which is very, very important. And given the low level of general education in uh, Africa, and particularly digital you know uh, financial uh, education and yet we, these are the i mean we are talking about to deepen digital finance if people the users you know which are which, which are the demand side uh, uh have some form of inadequacy in terms of knowing what those things should be i think it will really impact the future so i'm happy that you mentioned that as a pathway towards the future especially also digital education in the in the, in the schools particularly in the uh, elementary or secondary school, and I know a lot of STEM programs are ongoing in Africa to be able to improve and prepare uh, the young people of today for the digital world that they are, you know, uh, entering, entering, entering into. I think that's really, really, very, very good. And I'm sure Ebenezer also 
will have um, some some tips for us as to the future of digital finance uh, in Africa. What are those things we should focus on so that we're able to harness the potential of uh, the, what digital finance brings, particularly for the prosperity and improvement of the economy of Africa as a continent? Yeah, thank you, Shagun. I think I agree completely with James that we need to develop a curriculum that will inculcate digital learning and literacy right from the primary, uh, primary school level and across all levels of education. It is important because where we are, one positive about the COVID is that it brought the accelerated awareness of the relevance and adoption of uh, the digital finance model. You know, in Nigeria, within the period of lockdown, when for two weeks, people, you had money in the bank account, you couldn't access it. The only way institutions or businesses were going on was through the online. So for those who could not do so, they found themselves disenfranchised. So immediately after lockdown, everybody started rushing to the bank. And today, the rate of adoption of our uh, online channels is far higher than what we've seen. I mean, the rate, it has grown by over 200%. And uh, over 95% of the new accounts we are opening, they are being opened through the online channel. Therefore, if we are looking at what the projection of the World Bank, that the digital economy is going to account for about 25% of the world GDP in the year 2025 and accounting for about $23 trillion, it therefore means that we need to have that education and awareness. You can't show your ignorance in a digital space. If you show your ignorance, you are, you know, you will pay for it. Therefore, that education is important from a very early stage so that people are aware. Right now, if anybody compromises his pain and he's defrauded, he blames the bank. He doesn't blame himself. He thinks the bank should protect him. People need to understand that. The other issue for me will be the fact that, yes, if you look at the digital maturity level, I would say in Africa, we are like maybe about stage two, the stage one being the accidental, people just getting into the space just because they want to get in like the COVID-induced entrance. Then that's the accidental. They have to move to the intentional stage. We have to develop it to the intentional stage where we now start embracing, institutions start embracing every aspect of their business beyond the payment system. You look at your billing system. You look at your human resource. Every aspect of the operation of the enterprise need to be digitized. And you accelerate it to the point where you, have, you start having integration. You integrate, and when you get to the level of optimization, that's the time we start talking about the use of artificial intelligence, the big data, um, and all what. So we see that we need a lot of learning to be done. But then we also need to be patient with the individuals. We need to be patient, and I also believe that we need to be with them and try to understand their journey and let our product development and, and enhancement of their digital knowledge come from their own perspective. I tell you some of the things we are doing. Our product development, uh, yes, we have the payment system. Practically all our customers in the digital platform, they are using it. But we are mindful and being deliberately careful in migrating them to say, look, do you know you can do your wet management on the digital platform? But what we, are, we want to do is take it from their perspective. Let them enjoy what they are enjoying and let them desire more. From their desire for new items, we've, we've, we develop a product. We have instances where customers come to us and say, oh, I realize that in some cases I need to draw money from the ATM, but I don't have my, I don't have my uh, ATM card. What did mm. we do then? We developed a product that we call Pay With Code. Yes, I'm really enjoying this discussion, uh, but unfortunately, it appears our time is getting up. I hope we have another positive because these are really very interesting insights that you are sharing, some of the things that are, that are doing in terms of, and then some of your perspective about the future of digital finance in uh, Africa, which is really, really uh, awesome. I'm sure we can always engage later on to look at these things. Uh, our time is getting uh, you know, over. Unfortunately, we won't be able to take any questions. Thank you.